Hello, and thank you for joining NSBA for today's leadership issue discussion on labor and employment. My name is Molly Day here on staff with NSBA, and I'm happy to turn it over now to our president and CEO, Todd McCracken. Thank you, Molly. Sorry, I wasn't quite ready that I uh, uh, hadn't unmuted, unmuted myself yet, but. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us today. This is a, a great opportunity for uh, 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 us to meet with members of our leadership council. It's really, I think, really exclusive opportunity to shape our agenda for the coming for the coming uh, couple of years. Uh, just so you have a sense of what we're doing here today, in case some of you haven't participated in one of these sessions before, uh, every couple of years, the, small, the NSBA. Uh, brings leadership together to discuss sort of in an in-depth way the issues that are facing the small business community that are being dealt with by the president and the Congress uh, and to shape an agenda around both our primary concerns but looking at the political realities that are on the table right now. So that's what we're here to do today. This is the first session that we invite leadership council members exclusively to participate in. Uh, uh, it's a series of six meetings. This is the second in a series of six. Uh, yesterday we had tax policy and today is employment and labor. Uh, and uh, uh, this will culminate uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks in, a, in an overall session where we'll determine the, the priorities for the national small business community. Uh, I'm really pleased that uh, we are joined by NSBA's 2021 board chair, ML Mackey. Uh, ML is the uh, uh, CEO and co-founder of Beacon Interactive Systems, a uh, really dynamic company in Massachusetts, uh, uh, where she does uh, lots of, of defense work and other things for a wide range of clients. Um, and ML has just been a great leader for the, not just for the association, but the small business community in, in so many facets. So I'm going to turn things over to her and she's going to say a few words and we're going to uh, move forward with our program. So ML, thanks for being here. This time I remember to click the unmute button before I began talking. <laughs> Thank you for that very kind and generous welcome. I really appreciate it. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing to you Bob Shea. Bob is a long-standing advocate for small business. I really have enjoyed working with him both regionally in New England and then now nationally on the NSBA board. What I think all of you will come to find, um, as I have appreciated so much over the years with Bob, is he's very steady and he's very clear and he helps really bring together people in terms of the many different opinions and how do we act effectively and clearly communicate what we need to do. This is such a strong and necessary characteristic for advocacy. So Bob, I'm so so pleased to be able to work with you and, and leverage and, and lean on your strength in that way. I'd also put out to the Leadership Council, this is a lot of what we are we look for from you and that is that that very clear and purposeful voice to um, what is the real meaning of this and how would it actually affect a small business. So one of the things that I appreciate about NSBA, and I kind of think of it as this NSBA approach, there's, there's two things, well, there's three things. One is the tremendous people that we all get to work with and get to know. It's really a collaborative and a really fun group to work with. But the two sort of business things outside of that, my, my own personal selfish social uh, interests are that um, it's truly a small business voice. NSBA, Todd, the way you and your team run the business of this, it is not about you putting forward messages and then getting people to sign up. It is really about this very democratic voice of small businesses coming together, determining in this process that we are doing right now, what are the issues and that are important to us and what position should we advocate for? So I, I appreciate the process of coming up with the small business voice led perspective. I also truly appreciate, and I think all of us can really appreciate this. It always feels like I'm saying this every time, like in this unprecedented bipartisan and, and divisive time that NSBA is truly a nonpartisan organization. So I'm going to ask all of you to be thoughtful to um, when you are talking about an issue that you talk about how it affects small business, that it is about um, your perspective and being able to share it as well as being informed by other people's perspective. And I would also ask you to consider in your language that there is no us and them. 
it's an easy pattern to fall into but there's no us there's no them there's only we we are small business and we are figuring out how to best advocate for the small business engine across this country so with that in mind i will hand it back to you todd thank you very much ml and i'll just hand it over to bob shays and say a few words just sort of about nsba's policy process and where we've been and where we're going uh because he's the he's the man in charge of that on labor and employment issues uh then i'm gonna do a quick overview of some polling numbers for folks and then we're gonna get right to our to our panel and our speakers uh bob thank you todd and and thank you ml for your very kind words <laughs> yeah i'm turning red uh, an embarrassment, but uh, so my role here today is as chair of the Health and Human Resources uh, Policy Group, and we, uh, our group, has over ten business owners and professionals who help NSBA develop its policy decisions uh, in two areas. One is health and uh, employee benefits, and the other is labor and human resource issues. We monitor federal legislative uh, and agency, administrative agency activity. Uh, and developments affecting small businesses, where you look at it from the small business perspective. And we provide input to uh, NSBA leadership in developing its position on these issues. And just focusing on the labor and uh, HR area, uh, which is the topic uh, today, uh, we've had a lot of issues. Over the last uh, 12 months, we have uh, focused on uh, and provided input on proposed paid leave legislation in Congress and uh, activity at the U.S. Department of Labor, including regulations on overtime pay, joint employer status, and the test for determining whether workers can properly be classified as independent contractors. Those issues are now going to carry over into 20, or, or have carried over to 2021, and uh, have made a maybe 180 degree turn under the Biden administration. So uh, we expect our policy group would be very busy and uh, more of a focus this year, perhaps than past years, being in the labor and human resources area. Well, thanks, Bob. And we're getting to our discussion shortly. I just wanted to, if, if, if Molly, if you'll put up the, the polling numbers, and I apologize if some of you have been on the, on the, uh, on yesterday's call, we talked about some of these things yesterday, but I want to make sure everyone is up to speed on just kind of where the small business community stands on some surveys we've done just to, at, the, at the turn of the year. Uh, so I'm gonna run through these uh, uh, fairly quickly. If we'll go to the first slide, uh, Molly, we just sort of tried to get a sense of who are, who are the folks we're, we're surveying and who are in our members. And we also surveyed non-members as part of this uh, survey. The vast majority of the companies that we, that we deal with and talk to are half fewer than 20 employees, but they, uh, uh, they do run the gamut. Um, by organizational type, they are overwhelmingly pass-throughs, but a not inconsequential number of, of C corporations. Uh, but the most popular organizational structure was S Corp, followed very closely by LLCs. Let's go to the next one here. Uh, we asked them what their biggest concerns are, and it shouldn't be too big of a surprise, I don't think, that uh, economic uncertainty caused by the pandemic, which has uh, led to decline in customer spending in some cases are their three biggest concerns. Uh, but followed very closely by regulatory burdens, and a lot of those are fallen to the employment and labor camp, uh, lack of capital, uh, taxes, and then of course uh, a not inconsequential number that say lack of qualified workers, which is something else that we'll uh, I think discuss a bit today. Let's go on to the next one. Um, so we've asked them specifically how they've been impacted by the by the downturn and the and the, and the pandemic, economic downturn and the pandemic, um, and it really has reduced demand. Uh, but there's been a significant problem with uh, with employee absences, um, uh, delays in the supply chain, things like that that, uh, that that I think are relevant for our discussion here today. Uh, let's go to the next one. Almost the end here. Um, and so we've asked them what what have they seen happen as a result of the pandemic, and and there's a lot more teleworking as we all know, uh, um, 
you know, in-person events have changed. So there's there's been a very significant disruption in the way companies do business and the way they relate to their employees and the structures they may have had in place in their in the workforce. So this is something I think that we're going to have to continue to work on and think about as we as we deal with our workplace rules. And then let's go one more. And and we asked them about their near-term priorities. Um, and they're really most concerned about uh, regulatory burdens. And that is, is, is uh, imposing new burdens on these companies at a time where they really can't afford it. And, and again, many of these could very well wind up being in the, in the, in the workplace area. As, we're, as, as um, policymakers seek to protect workers, they may wind up inadvertently hurting them by hurting the businesses they work for. So we want to keep an eye on that. And then uh, finally, I believe, <laughs> that we wanted to ask them about what their longer term priorities are. And uh, uh, um, there's significant concern about any partisan gridlock and working together. But again, right up there near the top is, is uh, a reducing regulatory burdens. And again, so many of these burdens really do fall in the areas we're talking about today. So that's one of the reasons I think it really is quite relevant. Um, but also on the list, is uh, improve education and, and, and improve qualified workforce, which gets into education policy, immigration policy, and all the rest, which we'll also talk about a bit. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists, uh, but a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, we're gonna have a little bit of discussion with our experts who are, who, who are joining us today. And then we'll do some Q&A with you, and all, you all. So we're gonna have that Q&A to be moderated uh, by uh, Judy Milanese, our Vice President of Government Affairs, who's on the line also. Uh, but we're gonna do that through the Q&A function, not the chat function. So if you have a question you wanna ask, make sure you put it in the Q&A, which is at the bottom of the screen. The chat is open for just that, for chatting. If there's someone you wanna message who's on the line, there's someone you wanna connect with, uh, that is available. But, but it's the Q&A section that we're going to be monitoring specifically to, to get the questions um, asked and answered. So with that, let me introduce the, the folks we have on the line with us today. Uh, uh, first is uh, Mark Friedman. Uh, Mark is a longtime friend of the small business community, but I first uh, met Mark when he was working for the Senate Small Business Committee many years ago, and he, where he did uh, uh, a great deal of work on these issues and also regulatory issues of all kinds. And so he's a great expert on, on, uh, on small business and the, and the birds that they face. Uh, we're also being joined by Josh Ullman, uh, who... Uh, has his own uh, 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 public policy shop where he works for a, very, a variety of clients and coalitions, uh, again, on, on largely workforce issues. Uh, and uh, uh, he used to work for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is where Mark currently currently resides. So uh, we're happy to have both of you gentlemen on here today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, so, uh, Thank you, Todd. And it's an interesting little sequence because I, in fact, replaced Josh many years ago when I went to the chamber. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I call myself Josh 2.0. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you referenced my work at the Senate Small Business Committee, which is the position I had before I came to the chamber. And I'll tell you, once you work on small business issues, you never forget about the, the importance of small businesses. So it's always been part of our focus, you know, as, as I've gone forward. Yep. I appreciate it. Let's start. Bob's going to jump in here with some with some questions and, and dialogue also. But let's kind of start at the top. There's there's so many things that that, that we think will be happening this year uh, on the employment front, um, from changes to immigration law to 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 maybe some new uh, uh, ways we manage workforce to the ability of of unions to organize and and smaller and smaller shops. So as you look at that landscape, what do you think is most likely to happen first? Uh, what are the things that sort of keep you up at night that you think we all ought to know more about? So, Mark, why don't you go first and we'll ask Josh. Um, sure. And, and some of these things are things that I'm working most closely on, and some of these things are, are things that Josh is working most closely on. So I think you'll get a fair reading. Um, <clears throat> if I had to highlight the things that are going to happen soonest, um, I would put the OSHA response to the um, – you know, coronavirus issue up there as number one in 1A. Um, whether they're gonna do an emergency temporary standard is I think the issue that is occupying a lot of attention right now. Right. 
Um, and I think as some of you may have seen, the president has directed OSHA to consider whether to do an ETS and to, if so, to put one out by March 15th. So we're on a fairly tight window as to whether something's going to happen and, and finding out what that's going to look like. To be honest with you, I think all the smart money is on the idea of them coming out with an ETS. Um, the question really is, what does it look like? How much does it pick up things that have been very troubling uh, in states that have done it, like California? So that that's really sort of where most of the attention and, and discussion lies right now. Um, <clears throat> Outside of the OSHA discussion, there's a lot of wage and hour things I think we're going to see activity on. That will probably wait until they get an administrator in place. Um, you know, there's some EEOC things I think that are going to show up and some, some compensation data questions that are going to show up. Um, the legislative side, I mean, you know, you've got the COVID package moving through, which, you know, may or may not include a minimum wage component. That's the big debate right now. Right. Um, they seem to be having trouble keeping all the Democrats on board with that idea, which which may mean that it won't show up the way they talked about it, but I think we'll see something in the minimum wage area at some point. Josh, I wanna let you fill in the gap, sir. Yeah, that's a good start, Mark. I, and I think that covers a lot of the activity that's gonna go forward. Um, I agree with Mark on everything he said with respect to, to what we're going to see. I think the ETS, maybe the first time, Mark, um, I think the ETS is probably, um, you know, as Mark said, definitely coming at us. It just depends on what's going on. Uh, Mark and I are both trying to engage OSHA and the new folks there. It's a, a confusing you know, transition um, is confusing all the time. And with COVID sitting over it and various other political things kind of involved, um, it's definitely uh, something where it's difficult to make the connections and they're moving very quickly um, per the president's order, uh, executive order. But it's, you know, nailing down what does California look like? What are the, the problems with that? What do we do forward? Mark and I and others are working kind of hand in hand to move forward that. Um, with respect to um, some of the traditional labor stuff, which uh, Mark was indicating, some of us handle one, one thing more than ever. I, I sit a lot in the traditional labor space, the mm -hmm. labor management relations space. Um, we are, uh, you know, the PRO Act is in front of Congress and, and the president said he backs it. Um, and, and certainly there are members of Congress that support that act. The PRO Act is um, the newest uh, latest version of kind of a, a comprehensive uh, pro-union labor reform. Now we've seen these types of bills um, probably uh, rise to the potential of passing once a decade since the 1970s. Um, the Senate filibuster has been the thing that has prevented that from occurring. In the 1970s, um, we had labor law reform. In the 1990s, we had striker replacement. In the OTS, we had um, uh, Employee Free Choice Act, and now we have the PRO Act. Um, all those bills over time were all engaged to increase union density, ease the ability to, to unionize, et cetera. Um, you know, those have all, as I said, been def defeated by the filibuster at the end of the day. Here, um, I think that will also be the case. Um, the, the PRO Act is, you know, may even struggle to get through the House because of the, the, the changes in, in the makeup of the House from last Congress, they passed it last Congress. They may have a more difficult time. And then the filibuster sits here as a blockade to kind of move it through that. But the bigger question is, you know, whether that remains in place. We have two senators that say on the Democratic side that say they're not going to change the filibuster. Um, but even if it did change, uh, there's a real question if, if the unions could, could get the, the 50 um, Democratic standards all to agree to all the provisions in there. Many of them upsetting, many of the ones you, that were mentioned at the top of the call here, um, not in the wage hour context, as Mark was talking about, um, you know, over at DOL, but in, in the union organizing, and, the, and those are independent contractor and, and joint employer um, and, and the things we've seen before that, that really have a potential, even if there's not a union organizing drive, to disrupt things for um, 
very small businesses um, that depend on contracts from larger businesses or that depend on an independent contractor model to meet their needs. The, the, those changes in the law would be disruptive, whether you're a target of union organizing or you're not. There are changes in the law that everyone has to follow. So um, that's kind of my thought. Um, taking yeah, off you know, you know, I, I skipped over the wage and hour heading pretty quickly, but I should have noted that in the short term window, um, the rulemaking, the regulation on independent contractors that the Trump uh, department issued at the very end is still an open question. Um, it, it was a final reg, um, but the effective date was 60 days out, so it hasn't gone into effect. And there is now a notice and comment process on the question of whether it should be suspended. So we will be engaging in that to support the idea of that regulation going into effect. Um, I, I really take a very positive attitude towards that regulation. I think it's very balanced. It does not presage uh, a determination as the critics of it would have you believe. I, I think under their analysis, um, there is still ample opportunity for workers to be classified as employees. It does not um, guarantee an independent contractor um, classification. Yeah. So I, well, I think the regulation is, is much better than the way it's been attacked right. uh, as being. But that, you, that is a short-term item. That, that's in front of us. And you know they will be making a decision about what to do with that uh, in, in yeah. some period of weeks or months. Well, Mark, could you just take a minute and maybe explain briefly for folks who may not be as familiar with that rule, what exactly it does and what the benefit of it would be for uh, small businesses? Well, essentially what it does is it takes the term economic uh, reality test, which is enshrined in certain litigation, and builds it out so that people understand what it means. Um, in the Obama years, they issued an interpretation on what an economic realities test meant. And to be perfectly honest with you, it basically slanted everything towards someone being found as an employee. Um, in this case, the Department of Labor has built some other structures around that in terms of issues of control and whether the employee, whether the worker has an opportunity for profit or loss and, and how much they contribute to the enterprise. Uh, and so we now know better, or at least this regulation um, gives employers and employees and independent contractors a much clearer sense of what it means to work under the economic realities test. Uh, and as I said, I think they did a very balanced uh, job with it. And it, it, it's unfortunate that it's gotten attacked the way it has. I think it, it would do a lot of good for all parties that you know, they would know better now, you know, where they stand. Now, uh, on the issue of independent contractors, I mean, it's increasingly perilous for employers to classify uh, workers as independent contractors, not just because of federal law, but because of state law, California, Massachusetts, and increasing number of states have uh, enacted strict, difficult to meet independent contractor tests. So regardless of what the Department of Labor comes, comes out with, uh, it, it has somewhat limited impact, is that right? Yeah, I was just going to follow up. Follow up to that is: is there any depends on which state you work in? But yes, yeah. Yeah. I, I was just going to jump in and say there's no preemption from the federal rule overriding California, for instance. Uh, right. Unfortunately, California will remain California, even if the federal rule is is, is upheld and put into place. Yeah. Is, do you see any long term solution? I mean, it, would would Congress be so bold as to? Uh, pass legislation to try to regulate the uh, use of uh, or the the independent contractor test on a on a on a national basis to to take preemption the way that uh, you know ERISA establishes uh, federal preemption because we have such a patchwork of state laws and you have these laws like the Fair Labor Standards Act been around since 1935 conflicting with sort of the modern economy. And, you know, and that, that's all true. I, I fear that the way Congress would act in this case would, would be the way you don't want them to act. <laughs> Witness the PRO Act. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the ultimate solution here would be an amendment to the FLSA that says independent contractors, you know, mean the following things and enshrine 
a national test under the FLSA that would, you know, if they if they made it so they could preempt the other state tests that way. Um, from from you know your lips to Nancy Pelosi's ears, um, I, I, I'm not sure that that's a, a something that that we're going to see happen. In fact, I can tell you very confidently, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, one of the major problems we face, I was talking to another audience about this recently, um, you know, they're, they said, why doesn't, you know, why don't labor law reforms happen? And there's a lot of trouble coming to a compromise um, that, that, you know, both sides can agree to, you know, things that uh, might benefit employers with respect to preemption, and whether it be, you know, there's been talk about preemption with respect to leave for ages as we've seen kind of mandates pop up across multiple states uh, on, you know, sick leave and other things, um, you know, and, and um, the, the issues you're talking at hand, and even some reforms to, to um, the National Labor Relations Act that would be acceptable to the employer side or part of a compromise. Those things just haven't come in a way that the parties can seem to come together and the members of Congress can come together and move forward in a positive direction. So we don't see a lot of change until there's really a, a fundamental economic disruption almost um, that really kind of precipitates it. Um, or, you know, frankly, business comes to the table and says, we want this change. Um, and it's a pro employee change. And <laughs> they come to the table like the Americans with Disability Act many of the other things and said, we, we're ready to do this and we really want to do this. Um, and, and the upshot of that is what you're seeing now is that a lot of the energy to getting those policies in place goes through the state. Yeah. So you see the paid leave programs coming online in the states. You, you're talking about independent contractor, the minimum wage is the classic example. You know, you see that getting raised all over the country in various locations um, because they haven't been able to do it on the federal level. So the, unfortunately, that's a dynamic, and, and Josh is right. The, the problem is um, coming to the table with the with a common goal in mind. You know, we're never going to go to a table and say, "Let's figure out how to make union organizing easier." Uh, you know, we could go to the table and say, "Let's figure out how to do a paid leave program," and try and find people who are willing to work together on something that would respect the concerns that employers have and end up at the end with a paid leave program. Um, we have had efforts like that. We just haven't produced any fruit. Yeah. Um, independent contractor is something that tends to be too divisive to really get people together on. Yeah. Well, I would like to pursue this paid leave thing a little bit more though, uh, to switch switching gears a little bit. We actually have a question. I'd like to sort of bring our, our, uh, participants into this a little bit. So we have a just kind of a polling question we can do online here, asking them about the leads they currently uh, offer to their employees to get some sense of, of, of where people are. Then we can talk sort of some more about what's going on in Washington. So Molly, if you're able to put that uh, question up, I believe it's number five that we have here. Uh, and so people who are on this, if you can take just a few seconds here and vote and let us know what's happening in your businesses right now. Obviously, this is not a scientific poll, but I think it gives us a really good sense of how leading small businesses, what they're offering right now. And so therefore, what kind of uh, for, impact for purposes of your poll? Let me just ask a clarifying question. Yeah, I, I presume that's a sick leave concept, not a family leave concept. We're actually just asking uh, how much paid leave they're offering at all right now for any for any purpose. Okay. Um, and so people will just sort of respond to that real fast and then we'll give you the results. And then we can sort of talk more about what it means. That is that those two types of leave function quite differently. They do. Particularly in the context of when it gets mandated. Right. So okay, it looks back. like the it looks like the results are starting to slow down. We'll give it another five seconds and then I'll close right. it. Okay. Get up. All right. So it's so it's you know a pretty diverse range, obviously, uh, that we can all see. Um, 
but with you know some not inconsequential number of companies not offering paid leave um, and um, uh, probably the plurality being 10 to 20 days so that's of course for all purposes so I well, and, and Todd, I would look at those numbers and, and jump to the one that says no paid leave offered and say, what I see here is that 78% of the respondents offer some type of paid leave. Yes, that's uh, right. And that's an important number because we often get, you know, beat upside the head with statistics mm -hmm. about how the, the, the U.S. doesn't have a paid leave program and how many employees aren't getting paid leave. And, you know, I always take the position that there's no question that paid leave is desirable and necessary. Nobody doubts that. The question is how do you get the most companies, the most employers to be able to do it? And if you're going to force them to do it, how do you do it in a way right. that respects their concerns? Exactly. And, and we, but we've had for the first time uh, a, a, a mandated leave policy that affects employers of all sizes in the last year because of the pandemic. And it's been extended again, or it's being proposed to be extended again, excuse no, me. The requirement um, to provide paid leave went away December 31st. Right, right. but I would say, I say but, but the president has, has proposed extending it, and the bill's moving through the proposal to extend it again. And um, the question is, is what's, what do you think is going to be the impact of that on, on broader leave? Even if, even if the president gets his way, it'll expire again. But nevertheless, the precedent will have been set. How much momentum do you think this gives advocates for, for a, a paid leave program? Because this particular provision allows smaller companies to, to, it still causes cash flow problems, but they can at least recoup those expenses. That may or may not be the case of a more broad-based paid leave program in the future. So yeah. where do you think this issue stands politically? Does it have momentum? Uh, is the fact that this has only been temporary mean that there's still a lot of weirdness in Congress about doing a, a permanent one that we shouldn't worry too much about it. What's your take on the, on the way I talk about this is to say the landscape on the paid leave debate has shifted rather dramatically in the last year, largely because of things like a, the COVID um, needs. Um, we did have the mandates in the FFCRA. Mm -hmm. um, a quick update, the House Education Labor Committee in their budget reconciliation package did not include the president's request to expand the paid leave. So we're not sure where that sits in terms of getting into the big package. It, it right. right now doesn't look like it's in it, but of course there's a long way to go. Um, you know, the other things that have shifted the landscape are things like the federal employees who now have a, a paid family leave benefit that they didn't have before. Um, and, you know, companies are starting to bring this online as they can more than they did before. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say there's, there's, the earth has not stopped rotating on its axis now that we've had some paid leave provisions in place. Um, there's much more of, I think, an, a, a, an acceptance that this is something that could happen, but how it happens is the big debate. And at the same time, some states are implementing mandatory paid leave. Right. With different and I think that's a huge, huge part of it where we're seeing, um, you know, they're, they're, just increased comfortability because of the number of states that have operated. Um, and, and the argument certainly on Capitol Hill becomes harder that um, businesses aren't able to sustain it where we've seen in the state experiment, there have been some that, that have, and obviously a pandemic uh, brings forward the, the need for um, contagious people to stay home and, and the availability there. And then we, we're even seeing leave provisions pop up, for example, in the California OSHA standard, um, if you have to send your employees home because uh, of a, uh, uh, an incident where there's an outbreak and they may have had it, you need to make sure they're compensated. Now, there are a variety of ways that's handled, um, but we're, we're just seeing a lot of it. I think Mark's right. The landscape has changed dramatically for that. The real question at the end of the day is how, um, how Congress wants to move forward with this and whether they can come to a compromise on some issues. You know. The longer they hold on to 15 and can't move that, the more the chance of passing paid leave slips through their fingers because labor fatigue does set in. Um, we've seen this before where labor votes start to wear on members of Congress because the, the tension there between the impact on business and whatnot 
And I think the longer, you, you know, they can't move through their first labor priority, the second labor priority becomes harder, and the third becomes even harder in Congress. And we've seen that before. Um, so I think, you know, strangely, the prospects of paid leave may be somewhat tied to how long minimum wage blocks that pathway is my, my kind of initial read on how far it gets. That doesn't mean it's going to pass Congress if they even clear that, but it's, it, it, it's certainly hard to do two labor things at once um, just because committee focus and, and the energy that goes through it. Yeah, and I, I would also want to sort of point out the different types of paid leave because they really right. have two different debates around them. Yep. Um, you know, there's the paid six leave concept, which is enshrined in a bill called the Healthy Families Act, which we've seen reintroduced over the years. I don't think it's out yet, but I expect it'll be it'll come back. Yep. And then there's the paid family leave concept, which, for lack of a better distillation, is making the unpaid FMLA leave paid. Um, the there's two different mechanisms here. Under the Healthy Families Act concept, it tells employers thou shalt provide this amount of sick leave and you're covering the cost of the employee being out. In the paid family leave concept, they create something akin to um, an unemployment insurance fund model where employers and employees contribute into a fund and employees based on triggering events can submit to have their income reimbursed to a certain level. Um, that's a very big concept. It involves bureaucracy, it involves taxes, it involves leave requirements. It's a it's a, got a lot of moving parts to it. And it's going to be a very hard bill to move in terms of how many things have to come together on it. Even if there's more sympathies and energy behind it, I think it's going to have a much harder time getting done. The sick leave concept, you know, if they, let me just say this, the family leave concept has sort of overtaken the debate. But I wouldn't be surprised to see them come back to sick leave as saying, let's get what we can. And that's the kind of thing that, that may get some energy. And to clarify, I was talking about the Healthy Families Act and the sick leave. Uh, Mark, Mark picked that up. But the, the Family Act, yeah, it, it, we've seen those laws enacted in California, Massachusetts, and where else has it? Connecticut. it Michigan or Minnesota? Connecticut, Somewhere else Jersey, Connecticut. Um, Rhode Island, I think, has some. Right. Um, D.C. has it. Um, yep. with, with a flip where all the other states that had this um, fund it through assessments on employees in the District of Columbia, all the assessments are on employers. Um, it's the full employment for Roslyn, Virginia Act. Is the geography around it. Yeah. Well, we want to get to some Q and A from our, our our members around the line also, but before we do. do there, I think there'll be a lot of questions around sort of immigration policy. Do either of you have any take on what you think is going to happen, uh, either through executive action or legislatively, to change what's happening with immigration, make it easier for perhaps for employers to to find qualified workers, or the opposite? Do you have any sense of where we're going there? I'm going to really say I I don't have any. I'm way out of my skis just talking about okay. immigration. All right. But my joke is there'll be a lot of of uh, noise and drama before nothing happens. Um, but but I'll defer to anybody else who's closer to the discussion. Yeah, um, we, we cover it some, some of the immigration stuff, definitely. Um, um, I think, you know, as Mark says, we, we've kind of been through this before. Um, so it is hard to imagine a comprehensive immigration is gonna move, um, though maybe it's ripe now. Um, uh, you know, and certainly that that would involve changes to with respect to, um, you know, verification as well as the, the various visa programs. Uh, I do think that the Biden administration, um, though not overtly so, I, I think that they may share um, an interest in making sure that there's tight labor markets. Um, so, you know, we don't expect massive changes in the visa programs. Um, organized labor, you know, has concerns with visa programs in there. What we do expect, though, is, is just a different tone with respect to temporary protected status and, and some of those immigration programs um, th that are, you know, uh, more uh, based on humanitarian needs. And I would expect, you know, a different tone with respect to all of that, obviously. And then um, probably um, 
you know, some different policies around it. It'll be interesting to see how they handle some of the prevailing wage issues and other issues around H2B visas and some of the, the temporary work visas though, um, you know, because we, we started to see this during the Obama administration. And I think we'll see it in the Biden administration again, while now overtly saying so, I think, you know, there is an interest in making sure there's some tight labor markets. At least that's the feeling I get. They haven't spoke to it, but um, that's what I would think uh, is moving forward. Kind of more, more uh, kind of the Obama style, again, returning to that with respect to mm -hmm. some of the humanitarian programs. And then right. with H2B and H1B and those types of visa programs that, that are temporary, we may see, you know, not too much of a significant change with respect to some aspects of it um from from the prior administration okay about other other things you'd like to, to to address before we get to uh the member q a nope i think we can go right to the member okay. q a okay excellent well uh jody melanese is on the line jody she's been kind of monitoring the the, q, the questions as they come in to kind of pull out the ones that maybe haven't been addressed yet and all that so jody if you're on the line maybe you can uh begin to moderate and ask ask the questions. Yes, absolutely. We have gotten a number of questions coming in on uh, minimum wage. So we'll just start uh, probably there. Um, so this individual asks, what is the correct answer to setting an appropriate minimum wage at the federal level? There is a huge disparity in what can be considered a minimum standard of living at the state levels, as well as at localities. Would it be a flat minimum wage, the answer, relying on states and localities to adjust upward to account for an increased standard of living expense, or should it be calculated, um, the minimum wage calculations take into account these considerations? So what, what do you kind of envision there? Ah, that's two separate questions. What do we, <laughs> versus, versus what do we think is good? <laughs> right, right. right. Um, well, let me just get in there and say, I think 15, let me say, the chamber's position is that the $15 number is a political number and not supported uh, by economics. Right. And we, we, we see it as creating tremendous disruptive impacts in the economy, particularly as we talk about low skilled and first time employees um, who would, I think, literally be priced out of the market. Um, small businesses would certainly bear the brunt of the impact of, of an increase that, that would go to that number. The chamber has said that we are interested, we, we recognize the need to update the minimum wage. We're going to be in a, in a discussion that results in an increase. Um, we have not put out a number. I think our philosophy is it should be increased, but to the lowest number that makes sense and certain jurisdictions are going to increase above that. You know, if New York City wants to go high, New York City is New York City. San Francisco is San Francisco. Um, but we shouldn't try to set a national minimum wage based on what makes sense in San Francisco. And to, to Mark's point, in the Fair Labor Standards Act, we talk about it in a lot of situations, is designed specifically in the way, way, reason it doesn't have preemption, as we talked about in overtime and all these other things, it's designed to set a floor so regions can um, go above it. To that point, um, I don't, you know, and we've gone back and forth on this, you know, over the years, Mark and I in various fights, um, you know, region, getting regional minimum wages from the Department of Labor is a massive task. Um, and particularly if they need to be updated, um, which they would need to be updated more frequently because wage rates in a particular area aren't static. They can change with labor markets there very easily. Mm -hmm. So having um, the federal government set a, a regional wage has its own set of problems. And we dealt with that with the overtime issue in, in that that can pose uh, certain challenges overall for the government to actually implement. And I agree with Mark, what they should be doing is setting a wage that, that, that works in, in the middle of West Virginia, you know, in, in rural areas and lock down a kind of wage that works there. And that should be the minimum wage. And then you know, New York and California and, and um, urban areas can set that above, both through state action and, and local action. Um, the question is whether 725 or wherever we are, <laughs> um, you know, needs to be moved 
to, to something that, that functions, but something that functions in those uh, and sets a real minimum wage in those um, rural uh, lower cost areas, I think is what they need to be sensitive to and Congress needs to be sensitive to overall. One other point is I don't think this is a great time for Congress to be uh, messing with the tipped wage scheme. Um, I think that's a really, really bad idea. If you looked at the numbers this morning, it's very clear that the hospitality industry is where we've seen a lot of, a lot of the hits with respect to job loss and everything else. And, and I don't think, you know, whether you believe it should be changed or, or not, now is definitely the wrong time for, for that kind of movement. Yeah, I was just going to chime in on the tip wage thing. Um, you know, and the other consideration to take into account here is I don't think it's ever a great idea, a good idea even, to increase the cost of employees in a down economy. I mean, you, you really are playing with fire on that question. Um, and I, you know, the, the advocates for increased minimum wage call it a stimulus, but it's never shown a stimulus effect. Um, there's an argument for increasing it, but it really has to be done carefully. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move on. Um, so this individual has employees in six states, nine that are in California. The differences in state labor, labor laws makes it difficult to have a singular policy for employee benefits and conduct, especially um, related to paid time off and sick leave. Do you see any future where labor laws become more standardized across states? Well, it's certainly a motivating question for how we approach things like paid leave. Um, the chamber has been trying to promote the idea of getting a paid leave concept across the different states or allowing employers who operate in different states to have their own program that, that operates throughout the different states. Um, the answer to your question would be some legislative action. And I just, I have to tell you, I don't see how that happens, um, unfortunately, as it may be. Uh, and, and let's be clear, if there, if, if there was going to be legislative action, there would have to be a major give to get it done. So it wouldn't just be a question of saying everything's going to be the same. It'd be what you get out of it is it may not be what you want. Um, but I, I appreciate the concern and we've heard it from people all the time. Uh, California typically is an outlier on just about every issue. And so, you know, it is a challenge of people operating in California or other states on, on lots of different questions. Agreed. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, let's move on to another question. Um, this one says, this, in, uh, this participant says that the FMLA rules for employees, uh, for them to receive FMLA benefits, there's a jurisdiction rule that the law only applies to businesses that employ at least 50 employees mm -hmm. within a 75 mile radius. Because of today's um, you know, remote work uh, due to what's going on, is there provisions of, are these provisions of jurisdiction going to be changed anytime soon? Hmm. That's an excellent question. Um, you know, if you think back to when the FMLA was passed in 1991, <clears throat> there was no internet. <laughs> uh, not to mention the idea of remote working. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. I think that's the kind of thing that could happen from the Department of Labor in terms of some interpretations. Um, obviously, the ultimate answer is legislative fix. Um, it's a great question. I just, I'm stumped. I, I don't have any good answer in terms of what, what might happen there. I think there may be an answer to it. I, I mean, I've had this issue come up for, with clients in the, recently uh, during the time of COVID with people working remotely. And someone can be the only person working in Florida, for example, but reporting to an office in New York and the, the Department of Labor has interpreted the FMLA as extending coverage to that person, even though there's no other employee within 75 miles. Was that in the, in the Trump administration, Department of Labor, or was that during the previous? The you know, I, I think pre-Trump, but I, I don't think that was changed uh, okay. in, uh, Probably reflects a temporary assignment, Bob. 
Yeah, Something just along those lines. Yeah, yeah, a, a special yeah. role where someone is working yeah. remotely, but reporting into an office where that is covered. Right. Uh, I mean, that's certainly a big issue um, as we move forward. I think it'll be interesting to see how long they stretch that temporary line. I know we've seen it. Uh, we've seen it with uh, states trying to reach in and get tax revenue from various places, um, and, and that's been an interesting um, right. fight. I've had more states. I, I've got six employees um, scattered across a couple of states, and I've got clients all over the place. And I've had uh, more states asking for, uh, you know, where my work is cited suddenly in 1099s mm -hmm. as they're reaching in um, and trying to find uh, ways to. Uh, increase their own revenue. But you know, most commentators seem to think that the workforce is probably to a degree permanently changed over yeah. this pandemic, right? I the agree. nature of where people work. So these temporary suppositions can't hold for long, I would imagine, and they will, they will need to be addressed either legislatively or through executive action at some point, I would imagine. It's a great question. Um, I, you know, as Mark said, you know, I, I think it's, it's legislation will be tough, but uh, maybe we'll see a technical corrections to address yeah. a couple of statutes, you know, um, specifically with this. That's the kind of provision that get buried in, you know, uh, something with respect to COVID because, you know, it probably won't cause immense amounts of controversy, but, um, you know, I could see a technical fix in something there if it continues to be a problem. Next year's National Defense Authorization Act. <laughs> <laughs> right, perfect. <laughs> All right, what's next? Okay, great. Um, this participant says, um, how, how do you see the labor force and policy being affected by the talk of bringing more jobs stateside versus the offshoring of jobs, especially in the supply chain? Hmm. I'm stumped. That's not a question that I really... <laughs> yeah. Ever um <laughs> i think um I'll, I'll float on this one mark since you guys have a lot of mark the chamber does a lot of trade so mark has to be careful uh, mm. getting over his skis i don't do any trade but i um so i do think you know as i kind of go back to that tight labor markets theme and, and you know um the prior administration was obviously focused on that both from a trade perspective and, and an immigration perspective driving it by, by bringing more work home it'll be interesting to see what this administration does with trade um you know i think um since the clinton administration democrats have been very pro pro free trade uh i think there may be some questions in, in how it impacted those policies there are new questions on how those policies impacted the workforce um at least that have been raised um, both through elections and other things, and, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how they handle it. I mean, they've obviously said um, that, that they're they're doing their their own kind of buy American, hire American. Um, what how that manifests will be remain to be seen. I think there's um, definitely some some disappointment with trade adjustment assistance across the board and its ability to, to move those things along. Um, and then there's a lot of questions about robotics and um, you know, automation and whether driving those jobs home, there's a lot of talk that that also would drive more automation innovation back here um, and therefore kind of, you know, push our technology envelope. I don't really have a position on all these things other than watching them from a labor market perspective, um, but I, I would keep a close eye on that stuff and what the administration does. I wouldn't take for granted kind of the, 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 the Clinton um, Democrat embrace of free trade will move forward and actually you may see some republicans and democrats um because of you know what um uh, former president trump created in that area um where there, there's some more suspicion with respect to free trade on the republican side there may be um actually a bipartisan push on that we'll see um maybe not uh you know it's hard to know you know the, the chamber's typical stance is we support the free movement of goods to the maximum extent. Um, we've always supported trade agreements and the, and the like. Those fell out of favor in the previous administration. Um, I, I would also point out, I think some of the Biden administration's messaging on this is driven by their friends in the union community 
who yeah. see these jobs, the, the, what they're really talking about is manufacturing things, and that's the sector that tends to have a higher level of union activity, and therefore they're trying to bring work back into the, their sectors where they have friends. So uh, as far as a workforce question goes, I don't know that it's that much of an impact. I, I think the Chamber's view is we'd like to see things made in the most efficient way possible, and, and as, as we get goods and services from overseas, we sell goods and services from overseas to overseas. So we want to see that exchange happen to the most to, to the maximum extent possible. Okay. This participant asks, as a micro business that utilizes many 1099 employees for project-based work, how can I find out more in regards to regulations and legislation in this area? Well, um, first of all, I would be careful about the term 1099 employees. Um, 1099s are independent contractors and you shouldn't think of them as employees or refer to them as employees. But the, the basic point is that's a hot topic and there's things happening in that space all the time and, and right now through the Department of Labor and the regulation that we mentioned earlier. Um, it's a topic in legislation, it's part of the PRO Act that Josh mentioned, discussed earlier, because they would nationalize the California AB5 uh, requirements. Um, it, it's a very active area of debate as to how people get classified in terms of employees versus independent contractors. Um, the answer to your question on how to find out more, you know, bookmark the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division website and see what they're saying on a regular basis. And it, it's it, difficult, not just because, you know, some state laws like California have very difficult tests, but even under federal law, the IRS, you can meet the test for yeah. independent contractor classification under the uh, Internal Revenue Code, uh, the, you know, the 20-factor test, but not meet it perhaps for the uh, wage hour purposes under the Fair Labor Standards Act. That's a good point. I forgot all about the IRS, though. Yeah. And I do think Mark, Mark's got the point, though, with respect, if you're going to check anything, check federally the Fair Labor Standards Act. But um, I, I'm going to make an association plug here. You know, Todd and his team um, keep on top of these things and send out stuff. So that is their role. Um, so they'll send you out federal stuff, um, you know, with respect to state stuff. Um, you know, I, I think you, you should keep if you're in a state that uh, is regulating that carefully, um, then uh, you need to take a look at what what the state law is and get on that website and um, you know maybe sign up for uh, newsletters from the local law firms. Um, you can actually get some good stuff on there. If you look up a, a local law, labor and employment firm and those kind of stuff, they can provide a lot of uh, good information on that um, locally. And then you know again, your trade associations are on top of the changes here. Um, and they'll kick you out of your stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, nobody likes to hear us say, go hire a lawyer, but there are times when that's the sound approach. And what I like to tell people is, I'm not here to give legal advice, but if you think you're going to call somebody an independent contractor just because you don't want to pay them benefits, you're going to get hurt. Um, and it, it's there, there's reasons why lawyers are valuable in some of these contexts, and this is, I think, one of them. All right, well, maybe, uh, Judy, let's make this the last question. We can get our, so we can let Mark and Josh get back to their days. Okay, sure, absolutely. Um, and I'm sorry, folks, if we can't get to everybody's questions. I do see them all coming in, um, but we, you know, we have to be mindful of the time, too. Uh, so this one asks, what are they doing to expand funding to CTE programs, professional development and workforce readiness? Um, the funding should allow for new and innovative ways for younger individuals, such as high school and middle school um, individuals. Hmm. I don't have a good answer there. I mean, there's definitely efforts going out there, and, and I think a lot of people is the bipartisan support for for training and, and helping people uh, find different jobs. I mean, you know. I don't know if you've tracked it, but with the president's executive order shutting down the Keystone uh, pipeline, the whole question of when are these people going to find new jobs is, is becoming a big, big issue in the, in the public discussion. Um, I, 
short answer is I, I can't tell you what's happening in that area, but I, I know people who could if you want me to go go find that answer. Yeah, um, like Mark, um, I, I have someone on my team that specializes in it, and it's not me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, there was apprenticeship legislation that got out of the house, um, and, and we expect, you know, there will be a focus on apprenticeship in this administration, though it'll be the registered time, not that the um, industry recognized that the last administration was kind of um, experimenting with. Um, and then I would expect, you know, everyone's looking constantly at the job training programs and, and the opportunities there. Um, the chamber's got a whole division dedicated to it and some great people there. Um, I would check out their website to see what the latest is, you know, with respect to a lot of that stuff. They, they have tremendous resources and tremendous people there. That's where, you know, my team and I go a lot uh, to take a look at it. But, um, you know, there's a lot of effort there. Um, it has been a frustrating area for everyone. Um, it's just, it's, it's a hard nut to crack. It's one of those things that unfortunately, I think gets very polarizing because let's face it, our friends in the unions have a certain vested interest in how in talent pipeline and trying to make sure that the unions have an opportunity to control that in certain industries. Um, that tends to get in the way of what would otherwise, I think, be broadly supported efforts and, and, and bipartisanship. Yeah, and, um, you know, we also just struggle. I, I know there's just been a huge struggle even outside of kind of the biases with respect to some of that stuff we've seen in our apprenticeship, but even just the local uh, programs, there's a lot of coordination at a local level between the local business groups and getting them involved the local community colleges and that whole program and making it work. And, and you know, you, you can, you can try to come up with a model that, that works for everywhere um, or at least guidelines, but it, it's very hard to make it work everywhere. Um, and unfortunately the places that need, need it the most are often the ones that don't have the resources to really make it work well. Um, and I think that's the struggle. Here, here's a total flyer. Maybe this is something that the new first lady um, would turn her attention to since that's that's the kind of field in which she's been working. Um, so who knows? Maybe more energy going uh, coming at it from that direction. Okay. Well, any more last words for our uh, panelists, Bob, before we let them go? And um, everybody else, though, we need, to, we need to stay on the line because we have some more business to conduct yet. But uh, any final thoughts? If not, Todd, it's been a pleasure reconnecting with you and being in front of your members. I hope that, you know, we've been able to provide some value here. That was you absolutely fun. have. I don't have a good answer. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, you very much. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate it. Todd. I appreciate it. Um, take care. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Todd. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, all right, everybody. Now it's time for us to sort of, sort of get your feedback, and not only on what you just heard, because obviously, while there was a lot of information there, there's, there's still a lot more that maybe didn't get fully aired uh, because the topics are so <clears throat> so plentiful and robust. Uh, but we want to kind of move into a <clears throat> session where we get your uh, your feedback on relative priorities for the organization because out of this session we're going to forward uh, the priorities of the group for final consideration for the priorities of the association. And I just kind of wanted to add, I think I said this yesterday, you were on that uh, particular meeting, it's important to bear in mind that just because something may not be the top priority for the association doesn't mean that it, that it will go completely unaddressed. I mean, these, this prioritization session is designed to kind of be a guiding light, a, a guide star for the organization in terms of where we want to allocate resources, uh, where we want to be proactive. But certainly as issues arise and something looks like it's about to happen, uh, we're going to be engaged in it. Uh, things change and we've got to be nimble. I mean, uh, 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 as I've often pointed out, there was there was there was no PPP program or response to pandemic uh, that was in our priorities coming into this next Congress. But that didn't stop us from from taking a leadership role, not only in helping to shape those programs, but in getting information and and uh, and uh, data to members to help them navigate. So we we'll continue this. We we'll continue the same thing uh, moving ahead, but with with the, the understanding that the the places where we're going to be proactive and put our attention absent those uh, developments uh, are the priority list that you will deliver to us. Uh, 
So I think we'd like to go ahead and go to and sort of look at the list of, of uh, potential uh, uh, of issue areas. Uh, and again, uh, these are areas where we think where, where you think we should be spending our time. Not, I mean, think obviously as we just discussed, there are going to be developments. There are going to be new proposals in these areas. That's why we're not putting forth, you know, specific positions on 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 specific bills, but rather areas in which for us to 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 talk and and to work. So we're looking at an area we didn't really even talk about very much, but you'll know if it's important to your business or not, and that is pension reform and simplification, making it easier for small companies to have plans and for owners to participate in the plans. Uh, second, the minimum wage, making sure that if there is a minimum wage increase, that it has uh, minimal impact on the small business community and that it's, and it's implemented in a way that that is to uh, uh, that, it, that is fair and workable um, and takes into account regional and industry differences. The whole issue of paid family leave, and as we just discussed, that can, that can come down to different kinds of leave and, 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 and uh, different ways, but that's a really important uh, issue that's going to come up. Uh, what we keep hearing about is a trained workforce. You know, how much time and resources are we putting into that and trying to make sure that uh, um, the workforce that's available to the small business community is, is top notch. Then immigration reform. Um, and making sure that to the extent we are bringing workers in, we're bringing the right ones in who can really help us grow our businesses and, and help us keep companies in this country as opposed to moving offshore. Um, and then finally, uh, scheduling issues, flexible scheduling slash overtime. How do we define the work week? How do we, how do we make sure that companies have flexibility and so do employees in, in, in adapting to a to a work week. So those are kind of the big issue areas that we'd like for you to kind of prioritize. And so if Molly, you wouldn't mind sort of putting the survey up there and we'll, and we'll see what, uh, what, what people think. Um, as, you, as you'll see this, you're able to, you'll be able to choose uh, three priorities um, for, uh, um, for your consideration. So, um, you're not just limited to one thing, so, so you'll pick the three that you think are the most important and where NSBA should be putting resources. And then we'll, we'll stop and see what people, uh, people say. I'll just give us a few more seconds. This is a little bit more complex poll since there are multiple uh, multiple options. And and it is uh, true. Someone has just pointed out that that uh, as we as we put into the instructions initially that if that if you're on the web browser, unfortunately the polls don't show up. Uh, you need to be in on the on the app. Unfortunately, there's just not a way around that. Okay, it looks like people are starting to slow down. Let's give it another 10 seconds and then we'll right. uh, close the poll. All right, so it's looking like uh, minimum wage is the top concern, followed by trained workforce and uh, uh, paid leave. Uh, but uh, there's, other than the uh, worry about uh, union elections, there's not, uh, um, sig there's significant concern really about everything uh, and prioritization, but those are the top three. So. Uh, thank you all. We'll, we'll, we will share, be sharing these results uh, and those priorities uh, in our February 23rd meeting from this session. Um, uh, and, and we will be hosting similar events to this over the course of a year for folks to become 
uh, involved and 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 engaged with with other experts on some of these issues as the, as the year rolls forward on the on the uh, uh, health and human resource uh, uh, issue committee. So if you're interested in participating in those, make sure you sign up for that on that. Uh, committee and you will get all the uh, all the information um, and before I turn things back to uh, uh, ML Mackey our chair uh, to close us out today uh, I wanted to do a couple things one I want to thank Ring Central they're uh, our prime sponsor for this event and and they've given us lots of tools for for managing these events and uh, uh, helped us through this uh, and there's also going to be, a, uh, they've also are sponsoring a, a webinar you'll hear more about that's coming up in uh, March for helping you all ma manage these kinds of tools and figure out how to, how to maximize your ability to, uh, to use these kinds of services. Uh, but before I go to ML, Bob, do you have any closing thoughts or uh, remarks you'd like to share before we uh, uh, say our goodbyes? No, just uh, uh, there was uh, the panelists were, uh, were terrific and uh, it's going to be an interesting year at least <laughs> uh and there'll be a lot of activity and um uh and just like last year an sba i'm sure is going to have a significant impact we're certainly going to try to thanks bob and now <laughs> so i'm taking a beat off what you said bob the the whole it's going to be an interesting year what is that saying may you live in interesting times <laughs> So I'm so pleased, as always, with the participation from uh, the Leadership Council, from the board, from the NSBA membership. And Todd, thank you and your team for putting such a wealth of information on, on such a complex set of topics. And, and Bob, to your point, here's to the year ahead. Thank you for your participation. All right, thank you all for joining us. We have, and, and, and if you want to join more of these sessions, tomorrow we're talking healthcare, and then next week we're talking a regulatory policy and uh, capital access and trade and technology. So if you haven't signed up for any of those and want to, um, uh, you, all the information should be in your email box. So uh, get signed up and, and join us. Uh, thanks again. We'll talk to you all soon. Appreciate it.